Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> well, I may or may not be the one that forgot to give somebody a gift <laughs> at the new here stand, and may or may not have not done that just once, but twice. <laughs> So we're striking out this morning. Um, well, I wanted to start this morning as we get into this next letter to the next church by talking about one of the great joys that every parent has the honor of experiencing at some point, and that is this wonderful little thing called a temper tantrum. And if you're really lucky, you get to experience them in the middle of Target on the busiest day of the week. And, you know, when this happens, if, you know, you're not losing your mind with them because you're like, this is embarrassing, especially as a pastor that should have your children under better control than you do. <laughs> the next thought that you have is, I wish that they could see the bigger picture. I wish that they could see this from my perspective. I wish they could see that them not getting this or not having that is not going to be the end of the world. Maybe it's not the temper tantrum. Uh, maybe it's in a moment where they are overcome with fear about something. They're, they're overcome with fear about something that's coming up and it paralyzes them. Or maybe it's a moment where they are... Uh, They've been hurt, and they're in pain, and they're feeling pain. And, and in these moments, you just want to take them up in your arms and let them know this is not how it's always going to be. This is not how the pain is not going to last forever. You will not always be afraid. You want them to be able to know in this moment, yes, you are going through this, but you are in the strong hands of a loving father. That's what I want them to know. And I think for many of us, this is a reminder that we all need from time to time when it comes to our loving fathers to know that whatever we're going through, wherever we find ourselves, whether it's a place of pain or fear or worry, to know that we are still in the strong hands of our loving father. This morning, as we get into Revelation chapter 3 and this letter to the church in Philadelphia, we're going to be talking about a church that is suffering and was in need of reminder that they are still in the strong hands of their loving father. We're looking at the church in Philadelphia, and I want to show you a picture of where this church is. We've got a map that we've shown each week, so you can see there it's below Sardis. And uh, as we get into this, a couple of things that we know about Philadelphia. The first is this was a region that experienced a lot of earthquakes, uh, in fact, they had had a major earthquake in 17 AD that drove many people out of the city. Uh, imagine being in one of these ancient cities with these massive stone buildings that were not built to withstand earthquakes. And imagine an earthquake hitting and these buildings beginning to fall. It would have been a very scary place to be. And so what we know is that many people ended up just moving out of the city living in temporary dwellings out in fields because of the fear of an either another earthquake or a tremor, kind of a follow-up kind of to the, to the earthquake. And so many people lived outside of the city. These earthquakes drove them out of the city. Philadelphia is in an area that we now call the Alpide Belt. I think I've pronounced that correctly. But this region is the, has the second most seismic activity in the world after the Pacific's Ring of Fire. And so people were living with this constant uncertainty and this fear of when could the next earthquake hit. As I read this passage and as we get into this this morning, one of the things that I discovered as I read through this passage is that the uncertainty of their geographical reality was mirrored in their social reality and the uncertainty of their social reality. When we read this, we see that, that the Christians in Philadelphia had been removed from the synagogue. Uh, they had been removed because of their belief in Christ as the Messiah. And so it had removed them not only religiously, but socially from their support system. Uh, they were maligned for these beliefs. There was persecution happening. And on top of that, we believe that the church in Philadelphia was one of the smaller churches at this time. And so he mentions that they're of little power, that they, they lacked influence of any sort. And so there's lots of uncertainty. Their foundation, so to speak, is shaken. And as I read this passage, at the same time, one other thing grabbed me. 
I don't know if you noticed this as we read through this, but there are so many times, maybe more than any of the other letters, where Jesus says, I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. To give you a taste of this, verse 8, he says, I have placed before you a door that no one can close. Verse 9, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan bow at your feet. Verse 10, I will keep you from the hour of testing. Verse 12, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Verse 12 again, I will write on you the name of my God. The sense that you get as you read this is that, yes, they were in uncertain times, but more importantly, the big picture is they were still in the sure hands of God. That the immediate context was one of uncertainty, of their foundation being shaken, But the bigger picture is they were still in the sure hands of God. Just to kind of give us a little bit more context to get into the weeds of this a little bit more, I briefly want to hit on three things that Jesus says that are true of the church in Philadelphia, and then three things that he says will be true. So there's three things that are true of them in their suffering currently, but three things that will be true of them. The first thing that's said of them is that you are the least He says in verse 8, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Uh, The idea here is that they had been removed from the synagogue. Uh, The door had been closed to them for what their community understood was God's people. But Jesus is saying, no, I have opened a door for you that no one can close. But he has to do this because they're of little power. This isn't something that they could kind of create for themselves. They, that Jesus had to create this open door for them. So they're the least. The second thing is you are the maligned. Verse 9, it says, note this. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. The situation here, Sharon touched on this a few weeks ago, was this idea of the synagogue of Satan. I want to be clear, this was not an anti-Semitic statement. This was not to be taken for all time. This was referring to a specific situation in a specific city. And what was happening, it seems to be, is that those within the synagogue claimed that if they were followers of Jesus, they could not be among the people of God. And so people were left with this choice between, okay, do I choose to follow Jesus who I believe in or do I reject that and return to this community where I have support? And so they were doing the work of Satan for him by forcing people to make this choice and punishing them if they did choose to follow Jesus. They were lying about being God's people. If they were God's people, they would not be leading his people away from Jesus. And so they were being lied about that they were not God's people. The truth is, yes, they were. So they were maligned. And then the last thing is that they were left out. As we talked about, they've been ostracized from their community. And when we went into this series, one of the things that we said in the introduction was that, the Revel- that this book, Revelation, was to be a book of good news to God's people who were suffering in the first century. That first and foremost, and this is the part that often gets missed, we get so caught up in what does it mean for today? When is the end of the world coming? Who is the Antichrist? But we lose sight of the fact that Revelation was first and foremost for the faithful of God suffering under persecution in the first century who were in desperate need of God's reassurance that his people were not suffering in vain. And so into all of their pain and suffering and sense of insignificance, into their sense of marginalization, the God who opens doors that no one can close says three things to them. He says three things to them in in response to their current situation. He says, you may be the least, but you will be the first. Verse 11, he says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The crown that's being referred to here is the crown that was given to an athlete in a competition who won the race. And he's declaring to them, if you hold on, you will go from least to first in my kingdom. Second thing is, you may be the maligned, but you will be the favored. 
To go back to verse 9, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. That yes, right now you may be the maligned, but one day they will know that I have loved you. And then finally, he says, you may be the left out, but you will be the firmly planted. Verse 12, he says, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. You think, what is the the point of this? What is he trying to communicate with this idea of making them into a pillar in the temple of God, and he will never go out again? This idea of going out, he's referring to the fact that whenever these earthquakes hit, people kind of had to leave the city. They had to go out. Their worlds were turned upside down. They were shaken. They had to go out. But this pillar in the temple of God would have been a significant word picture for them. We talked about these earthquakes and the destruction that came, but I want to show you a couple of images from ancient Philadelphia to just to paint the picture for you. Now, this was a market in Philadelphia, and you see that there's lots of ruins, lots had fallen, uh, but these pillars were still standing. I want to show you a second picture kind of looking closer up at this road. So these massive pillars that were still standing 2,000 years later, these pillars would have been at least 2,000 years old now. And so what God is saying to his people in this passage is, you may feel you are in uncertain times. But I'm about to plant you like a pillar that will still be here in 2,000 years. And here's the word for you today, church. This is one of the things that I love about the power of Scripture, is that it takes a moment like this, and it's all the more powerful for us to read it 2,000 years later. Let me tell you what I mean. Christians in the church in Philadelphia did not get to see that these pillars are still here 2,000 years later. But church, you get to read God's promises to his people and see exactly what God meant when he told them this. I will make you a pillar in the temple of God, a pillar so firm it will withstand the abuse of 2,000 years of earthquakes, exposure to the elements, degradation, and you will still stand. I don't know what moment of uncertainty you find yourself in this morning. Moment of fear, the, the, the things crumbling around you. I know for some of us this morning, one of the things that we have talked about throughout this series in our immediate context is this coming election and how it's creating uncertainty for many of us, regardless of where we find ourselves, on which side of the election we find ourselves. There's a lot of fear around what the world will be like on November 5th, depending on who wins. Living with lots of uncertainty, overcoming Maybe it's not this. Maybe there's something else that's creating uncertainty. The feeling of being displaced, of shaken to your core. We find ourselves in a similar place to our young children, overcome with fear and pain. And God wants us to know that we are still in the loving hands of our Father. And that the bigger picture may not be what it seems. That we jump to some conclusions sometimes about what the bigger picture is, about what must be the outcome, about what this must mean. I want to give you kind of a comical example of this. There was an old story about a wise uh, man living on one of China's vast frontiers. And one day, for no apparent reason, his son's horse ran away and was taken by nomads across the border. Everyone tried to offer consolation for the man's bad fortune, but his father, a wise man, said, What makes you so sure this is not a blessing? Months later, the horse returned, bringing with her a magnificent stallion. This time, everyone was full of congratulations for the son's good fortune. But now his father said, what makes you so sure this isn't a disaster? Their household was made richer by this fine horse the son loved to ride. But one day he fell off his horse and broke his hip. Once again, everyone offered their consolation for his bad luck, but his father said, what makes you so sure this is not a blessing? 
A year later, nomads invaded, and every able-bodied man was required to take up his bow and go into battle. The Chinese families living on the border lost nine out of ten men who went to fight. Only because the son was lame did the father and his son survive to take care of each other. The bigger picture, what's going on, is not always clear. And as we continue through this passage, we see that we've been told some things that are true about who we will be, about the bigger picture, about what God is up to, that maybe goes beyond what we can see and understand in our immediate context. But there's also something that it tells us about God, something important for us to know in our suffering that God wants us to know about Who he is, that he is the God who opens doors that no one can close. That you serve a God who opens doors that no one can close. And scripture, as we look through it, reveals God's track record for this. And so wherever you feel maybe that you're stuck this morning and there's no way out, maybe there's uncertainty that you feel like there's no way around. Maybe there's a hopelessness that you feel like has no end. I want to invite you to hear this story of how the sure hand of God brought them through a door that no one could close. Genesis 1.1, going back to the very beginning, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What this is telling us is that this God doesn't just open doors. He is the original cause that creates doors in the first place. And so if he can create them, he can keep them open. But we fast forward then to God's people who are fleeing oppression in Egypt. And they find themselves trapped between the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh and his army behind them. There's no way out. And God opens the door of the Red Sea for his people to cross and then slams it closed on Pharaoh and his army. Exodus 15, after they have come across the the Red Sea, they say this. They said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. He has thrown down the horse and its rider into the sea. Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You will bring your people in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. We fast forward again to the time when Moses has died and the mantle of leadership for God's people passes to, jo- to Joshua. And in Joshua 1.9, God says to him, Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The time has come for Israel to leave the wilderness and to cross into the promised land But the Jordan stood before them, overflowing its banks. It stood like a door locked in front of them. One of the things that I love about this point in the story is that the instruction was not to go to the river and wait for it to part and then walk across. The instruction for God's people was to step into the river and then it would part. It was a step of faith, a step of confidence in the strong hand of God. And so they had to step into the water before it would part. And so they step into the water, and God drives back the water for the whole nation of Israel to cross. And after they cross, in gratitude, they erect a monument of stone as a sign to future generations. And they they said, when future generations ask what this stone meant, he said, you should tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry land. The Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. This is so that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty. Fast forward again to the story of Daniel. Daniel was living in exile, and he had pledged his faithfulness to God and did not deny his name. 
even at the risk of his own life. And so this decree had gone out that anyone who prays to anyone other than King Darius would be thrown into this lion's den. Well, David, or Daniel is discovered worshiping the Lord and praying to him, and so he is thrown into the lion's den. And the next morning, Darius runs out and says to him, Was your God able to rescue you from the lion's? And Daniel declares from the lion's den, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they haven't harmed me for I was found innocent before him. Talk about a path that seems to have no way out. There is no way to escape, but the Lord shuts the mouths of the lions, opening a door for Daniel's salvation. In response to this, King Darius declares, People must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. In their immediate context, right, it may be suffering, but the bigger picture is you're still in the sure hands of God, and there is nothing bigger than the sure hands of God. His dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Finally, these Christians in Philadelphia Philadelphia had surely heard the story of Paul and Silas, excuse me, and their escape from prison. Paul and Silas, uh, we know from the book of Acts, were two of the early church planters who helped carry the message of Jesus all over their region. And Paul and Silas were in Philippi, and there they are unlawfully beaten with rods and thrown into prison. And one of the things that just always challenges me in this story is after having been beaten with rods and thrown into prison, I would be having a little bit of self-pity, I'm going to be honest. Like, woe is me, look what I've been through. But instead, it tells us that at midnight they were singing hymns, And all the prisoners were listening. And then Acts 16, verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake quake that the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's chains came loose. They were rescued by God's use of a foundation shaking earthquake. In other words, they were suffering, but they were suffering in the sure hands of God who opens doors that no one can close. This image of God's hands, I've given you a taste of it, but we see this all over scripture. They're referred to more than a hundred times throughout scripture about the sure hands of God. Some of them are well known, Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 136, 12, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, his faithful love endures forever. They were suffering, but they were in the sure hand of God. To bring this home a little bit more for us, one of the greatest earthquakes to have ever happened in recorded history, and the greatest earthquake to have ever hit in American history hit in 1964. It hit in Prince William Sound, Alaska. It hit at 5.30 in the evening, and it lasted for almost five minutes. It was a magnitude 9.2 earthquake, and it happened because 600 miles of fault line ruptured at once. The power of this was so large that 1,200 miles from the epicenter of this earthquake, the Seattle Sky Needle perceptively shook. And speaking of the power of this earthquake, the power released in this earthquake was said to have been 400 times the total energy of all nuclear bombs ever exploded. An immense amount of energy And in some areas, it raised the land as much as 30 feet. What's truly remarkable as I read this story 
is that this took place on March 27th of that year, which was Good Friday. What this brings to mind for me is that the most powerful use of the sure hands of God to rescue his people was not in a miracle of parting seas or opening jail doors with earthquakes. The most powerful use of the sure hands of God was not to plunder a foreign enemy or to defeat a giant. The most powerful use was when the strong hands of God were pierced with nails from a Roman soldier and he didn't take them out that he left them in there. With outstretched arms, he held up the rushing waves of guilt and shame so that we could pass through into the promised land of life with God. That he held closed the mouth of condemnation and judgment that wanted to devour us. And he broke open our prison cells so that we could walk out in new freedom. This morning, you may be suffering, but I want you to know you're doing so still in the sure hands of a loving Father. And that pain and sorrow, yes, they may be for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And so I want to leave you with the, the same words that Jesus gave to this church that found it in a place of suffering, which was hold on to what you have because the sure hands of God are holding on to you. Each week we take communion together, but I want to do it a little bit different this week. I want us to take this meal together as a celebration as a celebration of this meal, which reminds us each week that, yes, Christ broke his body, but that is not how the story ends, and that even in death, Christ was not beyond the sure hands of his loving Father who raised him again to new life. That as we take this bread, we take it as a reminder that though we may break our bodies with him, he will also heal and raise our bodies to resurrection life. And so sometimes we take this meal as a reminder of the sacrifice that Christ made. And we take that solemnly, but today I want to take it in celebration together as God's people. And so I invite you to take the bread. As we remember the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents the blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, this morning we celebrate that our suffering is not the end of the story. We celebrate that you are a God who did not just stand far off and watch us in our suffering, but God, you scooped us up in your sure hands. You came near us. You took on our flesh. You endured the suffering. but you also gave us a way out. You gave us a hope and a future. But this is not how the story ends. And so God, this morning, wherever we find ourselves, whatever uncertainty we find ourselves in, no matter what is falling down and crumbling around us, God, let us remember, remind us that we are still in the sure hands of our loving Father. That there's nothing greater than that. And that, God, this morning, we can stand in hope and joy in that. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you would like somebody to pray with you, we're going to have our prayer team available to the sides. We'd love an opportunity to pray with you, whether it's about something on this or just something in life. We would love to take a moment and pray with you. I invite you all to stand and sing with us. <clears throat> 